Market Musings podcast with Fairbairn and Russell. Welcome back to the Market Musings podcast here from Stockbox. And joining us today is Christopher Gatyson, who is the CEO of Nova Minerals. Hey, Christopher, how are you? Hi, fellas. Great to be with you today. Good to be talking to you. Now, I think you're possibly one of the furthest uh, geographically away from what we've spoken to before, because you're all the way over in Alaska, aren't you? So that's that's you know, that's, that's a decent way that's away, right. decent way away from where we are. We do talk to people in Australia, which is also a long way away. But going the other way, um, you're probably the furthest. So congratulations there. <laughs> Thank you very much. You know, our so Nova Minerals. Is our is our parent company, and so that's Australia. So it's we got a situation here, and our flagship operation is in Alaska. So we got a situation here where up top meets down under. You know, there couldn't be a larger <laughs> contrast here, right? So you yeah. have basically Australia, pretty much flat ground, and then you have Alaska, which is very mountainous. You got the uh, you know the wildlife in Australia. It's all about creepy crawlies and no see them type creatures that are dangerous. Whereas here, everything's very large to attack you you got 40 <laughs> above as opposed to 40 below in terms of the temperature so there couldn't be a a, a, a bigger contrast which is uh you know the two extremes in the world and it, it, with the temperature you know 40 i actually prefer the cold temperature you know because uh, uh you, in australia i mean you can only strip down so far right in, in, yeah. in alaska when it's 40 below at least you can keep putting you on you can further, keep more putting more. on for <laughs> right right you know so with in alaska once it's one above you know we start busting out our speedos up up, up here so yeah. you get a climb a, a well, talking of putting on fur kenny how are you yeah hi christopher how are you doing good 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 to see yeah, you Ken. i think you just described scotland's uh climate there so you did it can be a bit like that you can get four seasons in one day but uh I must admit, anything above sort of two or three degrees, and I'm a shorts and t-shirt man. Uh, That's a, the spirit. A yeah. few strange looks in the middle of winter, walking down the street with shorts and t-shirt on. But that's not that's why I've got a few extra pounds. It just uh, insulates me from the from from the cold. But uh, no, it's it's great to have you on. And obviously, Mark's spoken to you a, a few times before, and this this is my first time speaking to you. So. So yeah, you're, you're calling from Alaska tonight. So whereabouts in Alaska? Because Alaska is a massive place. It's, it's not as, you know, I don't think people appreciate how big it actually is. That's right. Yeah. So uh, Alaska is the 49th state in uh, in the United States of America. We, we um, we're the largest state by area and the smallest state by population. And so in Alaska, we have a bit of a bit of a joke. You know. How Texans are they're they're very proud of, you know, they're the largest state by area. Where in Alaska, we kind of say, let's cut Alaska in half and make Texas the third largest state, right? That's how <laughs> that's how large we are. So our population here, so we uh, our land area constitutes, if you were to put Alaska on top of, you know, superimposed on top of the uh the uh what we call the lower 48, you know, United States proper, it, it represents uh over 20% of of the land area of, of what the um of, of the actual lower 48. And so, but we only have 700,000, about 700,000 people up here. Uh, half uh, or, or about 300,000 of those live in our main city of Anchorage, Anchorage, Alaska. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and the remaining in, in Juneau down there, that's our capital. There's about, uh, oh, 30, 20, 30,000 down there. You know, we keep our politicians isolated down there. You can only either <laughs> boat or fly into the area. You can't actually drive there. So we keep them down there to, to take, to, to make sure we can keep a good eye on them. And then there's also Fairbanks, which is in the interior of Alaska, uh, which is about 50,000 people. And the rest are just spread out, very rural, rural here. A lot of native, Alaska native villages and, you know, it, um, very um, I, I isolated and still living in the traditional ways, subsistence uh, type. So anyway, I'm located in south central Alaska, which is about 40 miles north of the city of Anchorage. And I'm, 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 I'm located in the in the um, the mat, what we call the Matanuska Susitna Valley, those are two rivers: the Matanuska River and the Susitna Valley. And in the, the Matsu Valley is the fastest growing area uh, in Alaska. And the main the main towns here are Wasilla, uh, it, it, it is there. It's about thirty thousand people. And Palmer, I live in Palmer. There's about five thousand people here. Palmer is actually what you might call the the agricultural center of of Alaska. This is where um, you know we we have a, a bit of agriculture. We, potatoes are good, uh, and with the growth, you know. 
many people are surprised with growing uh, agriculture in Alaska. We have world record pumpkins, zucchinis, uh, um, carrots, potatoes. If you go to the Alaska State Fair, which is every year in Palmer, these things are just massive. Pumpkins the size, you can imagine a Cinderella carriage. Pumpkins that size is absolutely huge. With the way the light is up here up north, you know, you get that. Uh, in the beginning of the growing season, you have a lot of light. So the, the plant really grows quickly. And then as the light wanes, you get that vegetative growth and the, the, uh, the, the, the vegetables grow just super, super large. So that's where I am in South Central Alaska, in, uh, in Palmer, Alaska, which is perfect for our Nova Minerals flagship operation, the Estelle Gold Project, which is also in the Matanuska, the Matsu Borough, which is like a council that you might have there, or in Australia they call it a council. And so the project is actually right here in my backyard. As the crow flies, it's about uh, 80 miles from where I actually live. And so uh, it's, uh, I'm ideally placed uh, right here to be able to, to manage and, and keep pushing this project forward. Now, um, uh, yeah, so, so there, there you have it. That's, uh, that's my situation. Perfect, okay. perfect. All right, before we come on to the project, which we'll cover sort of later on the podcast, I wonder if you could, I mean, we, well, we're actually a great believer that, uh, you know, people invest in people. So we, in Market Musings, we like to uh, find out a lot about the CEO rather than just giving you the standard 20 questions about the, the, the project. We want you to go back to your, well, you can go back as far as you want. You can, you can tell us where you were born, where you were brought up, how you get into, you know, mining, what your education was like, you know, previous jobs, et cetera, et cetera. It's really, really the floor is yours for the next sort of 10, 15 minutes. Maybe you tell, a bit, tell us a bit about yourself and, and go back as, as far as you want, Christopher. It's up to you. Okay. Uh, so I exited my mother's womb in 1973. <laughs> I won't go that far back. But so no, I, I grew up, I was, uh, I, I was actually, um, my, my, uh, you know, my, my father was American. He was in the Air Force, and he met my mother, and uh, she was German, actually. He was stationed over there in, German, in Germany. And so I lived my, my early years um, traveling around to, you know, different military bases. I lived in Berlin, Germany, okay. and, you know, my grandparents were German. And so this is where I have a bit of a, a, a German background as well. You know, I speak a fluent German as well. And mm. I, uh, in my, in my uh, uh, young, younger years, when we were based here in Alaska, this is how we came to Alaska in 1980. And um, uh, after spending time in, um, in, in Berlin, Ger Germany in the 70s. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, it, when we came to Alaska, every summer, I would go to, uh, to Germany and spend time with my grandparents over there. So I've traveled all around Europe. They used to take us on beautiful uh, holidays and vacations there around Germany and, and Europe, many places. And I remember when I was a kid, you know, uh, in La being in Alaska, you know, the uh, big out outdoors and hunting and fishing. And so we would go to these, these, these great places and go fishing. And I would always be fascinated with the rocks. The ones that really appealed to me were those, you know, those, those stones. And they always have a vein going through them. And I was always so intrigued by these veins going through there. And later on, I, I started to learn and read a bit. I had a bit of a pet rock collection. So I was always, I was, I was always fascinated, fascinated with rocks. But of course, then when I was uh, 14 years old, dad said, you know, it's time to work, boy. So no more vacations for me. And uh, I had all kinds of uh, odd jobs in, in, in those days. I, I would uh, I, I help people with some construction on their houses. You know, this was all just uh, cash in hand type of work. Yeah, you, you, my dad taught me pretty early on, you know, drive me around neighborhoods going, that guy's building something over there, building an addition onto his house. Go over there and ask him if he needs help. And, you know, that's where I learned if, if you want to work, there's always work. You know, you, you, you can't be picky, especially at a young kid. I've, I've done construction. I've done uh, I, oh, some of the jobs I've had were uh, I, I worked in a, a rental car detailer detailer. You know, the, in, in Alaska, that's a pretty that's a pretty painful job because these tourists come up and they go fishing and these cars would come back and you got to clean them out. Oh, I see dead fish and carcasses and all kinds of stuff in these cars. So I, uh, you know, I got used to uh, I, I got used to a bit. Let's call it the dirty jobs mm. pretty early on. Um, and then, um, you know, so I was always fascinated with geology. I remember I took my first uh, geology course in uh, in high school, actually, as an elective, and uh, I'll never, I'll never, I'll never forget it. It was my, it was the the most, uh, um, the the my favorite class in in all of high school. And um, I remember I, I, we we had a, an assignment there, uh, you know, like a bit of a, 
a geology lab and we were to identify these rocks. And I would go to the teacher and Mr. Tunley, I'll never, I'll never forget him. And, and I said, Mr. Tunley, uh, you know, I can't figure this one out. What is it? He's like, well, and he, and he looked at the rock and he said, what are you? And then he put the rock up to his ear and he said, oh, you got to ask the rocks speak. And I found out later in life, actually, the rocks do speak. I have spoken to many rocks being isolated in the field and they're great, great uh, conversationalists. And so if you listen to the rocks as a geologist, uh, you can find that vector and it'll tell you where that where that ore body is. Also, you know, it's very uh, geology and identifying rocks and finding out uh, exploring for mineralization. It's not just about your ears. It's also about your eyes, mm -hmm. about the taste. You know, they call us rock lickers, right? About the <laughs> taste. Uh, and and uh, there's all these properties, the rocks and minerals, where you can identify them. And so that that's um, using all your five senses to identify rocks and to in, in the field to hone in on, uh, on, on certain, uh, you know, if you're looking for mineralization, gold, copper, then um, uh, the, the, you're not just limited. It's a very, it's a very inexact science, but a very um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, a full, you know, com complete. It's a sensual science. Let's call it that. There you go. New, new, uh, new, de new word for it. Sensual science, and that you're using all your, all your senses mm -hmm. to identify rocks. So I always liked geology in high school. Now, when it was time to go to school, to, to, uh, to then to university, I, you know, I, I spoke to my father. And I said, you know what, what I, I really like geology. And, and, and my father didn't know that much about geology. He, he's like, you know, why don't you do something like economics, this and that, which, which, which was also a, a something I, I like, you know, I like, I like to look at already stocks and financial stuff or, uh, in, in high school. And so when I went to college, I went to the University of Idaho, which, which actually there's not many, uh, you know, um, at universities in America, there's not many really focused mining and exploration colleges left in these universities you know there's the colorado school of mines there's there's montana there's wisconsin there's missouri but also at, in idaho in, in idaho there's the college of mines and earth resources which has a very focused program in in, in mining and exploration and at that stage i didn't know exactly that i wanted to do mining and exploration but i, I knew i liked geology but i went into college on my father's advice to to, to go for economics and uh so i, I started I, I started that first semester with with economics and, uh, and, you know, I had this roommate, I, I had this roommate, uh, Nick, and he was a geology major. And so I, I would be sitting there in the books, looking at supply demand curves and doing all this economic stuff. And every weekend, you know, he would come back from the field, just totally like, you know, obviously had a great time, drenched, filthy, and he crashed out. And he's like, oh, it was another great field camp. And I just thought to myself, you know what? I want to do that, you know, and, and that's, that's what I wanted to do originally. And that's that's my calling. And so uh, after that first semester, I switched my major to geology right there and then, and I never looked back, back since. And that first, the next semester, I went to my geology 101 course, and uh, uh, the, the the professor just said, he's like, "Welcome to geology 101. This is your passport to the world." <laughs> and and absolutely, it has been. And so as I uh, you know started taking geology, and I had my my um, uh, my uh, our group of, of of students, which are good friends to this day, um, I it, I really started to focus. Then I realized that I wanted to do the not just geology in an academic sense or in a, in, a, in a research sense, but I really want to focus on the industry aspect of it, of uh, uh, of, of the mining and exploration. That's what really fa uh, uh, was really my calling, um, and, and and so I, I really started to focus on that and um, going into that aspect of it because. You know, there's a, there's a great bumper sticker out there, and it's so true. You, if you can't grow it, you got to mine it. So many people don't realize, especially in our world today, with the technology and, and, and sitting behind computers, that everything, you know, if you look around you, mm. everywhere, everything comes from the earth, right? Mm -hmm. Everything, the plastics, oil, the, your phone, all these, uh, you know, uh, glass and just anything. I'm just looking at my desk here and just everything comes from the earth. And many people don't even have that perspective. You know, you, you, a lot of people that are, let's say, uh, um, you know, and, and let's call it anti-mining. They look around, you know, we live in the city. We don't need these resources here. And that's where it all goes, you know. So there's a, uh, it's, it's kind of frustrating sometimes being in this business that we add so this business and this industry adds so much to our to uh, um, our, our lives and how, how far we've come as a society in terms of uh, making our lives easier. People don't really appreciate that sometimes. It's a thankless job. But, you know, so. 
so as I was, as I was in college, then um, la- later on, uh, being from Alaska, I would always come home in the summer, and then in my uh, you know my my latter years there in college, I started looking for work, and I actually started my started my work my working career here in Alaska, up there up here in Fairbanks, working on these. Uh, it was an exploration job on the True North pro- uh, project, mm. uh, uh, which is right across the street from Fort Knox. Um, at Ken Ross's Fort Knox deposit right now. And it's actually mined out, but it's these intrusive related gold systems. And, uh, you know, little I was, I didn't know then that that, that, that even initial first uh, real industry work experience w- would come back and be useful uh, for what I'm doing today at this very moment. And, and so, so I, I worked on that deposit. Then I, then I, uh, when, when I graduated, I was looking around for jobs and I started working in, uh, in Nevada. This is where you have these uh, very large bulk mineable heap leach operations uh, working for Newmont and Barrick has large mines out there, home stake in those days. And, um, and, 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 and once again, you know, I was a mine geologist. That was my first experience as a mine geologist. I would be in my job was, you know, associated with all the day to day operations in terms of the geology side. What, this truck goes here, that truck goes here, grade control, um, really maximizing, this is such critical work to maximize uh, the, the, the profit and, re, and, and minimize the loss when it comes to mining, because, you know, ore loss and dilution are some of the largest uh, m- uh, problems in, in mines. And that's what a mine geologist basically does all day. And uh, so I, I, I was very, very, uh, uh, that, that was my job as a mine geologist, working in some of the largest uh, mines in the world, you know, Gold Quarry, Post Betsy, or they call it Gold Strike over there. And these mines are still going today. Uh, these are 30, 40 million ounce deposits. Mm. Some of these things, you know, 10 million ounces, not uncommon. Uh, and so I, I spent many years there. Then I, the, the, the way I got to Australia and why I, I have, you know, an Australian connection and an Australian network is I, uh, I, I was there working when I was doing the night shift, actually. And I was reading, I think it was EM&J magazine. It was one of these mining, mining journals. And I saw an ad in there and it was, uh, and, it, and it was basically an ad for a scholarship for, uh, by, by Dresser Komatsu, Dresser Komatsu. And they said, you know, this is an opportunity for, uh, uh, to go to the Western Australia School of Mines in, in um, Kalgoorlie, Western Australia. Uh, it's affiliated with Curtin University over there. And um, basically it, it said, you know, uh, um, all, all of the, the requirements, uh, I, I met all those and I thought, okay, well, I'm going to have a stab at this. And I spent the next night, a couple of night shifts, to, you know, preparing all the documentation. And I, uh, I, um, I just submitted it and thought, oh, yeah, we'll see what happens. And a few weeks later, I got a letter in the mail and it said, congratulations, you've been awarded the, uh, uh, the, the Dresser uh, Komatsu Scholarship, full, full ride to get your master's degree at the Western Australia School of Mines. And I, and I, 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 I thought, wow, this is great. I went to my boss there and I said, you know, what do you think of this? Is this real? <laughs> and uh, he said, yeah, you got to take this opportunity. And so I got on, uh, I, you know, I put, it, I, I, I put in my resignation and within uh, a couple of months, I was on a plane to Australia on a new, on a new adventure. Mm. I remember uh, I landed on the way to Kalgoorlie, Western Australia, one of the premier uh, and historical mining districts in the world, you know, it, it's uh, so exciting. You know, that Cal Gorley, the, the the West Australian gold fields, and say, yep. uh, you know, the Whist- Witchwaters ran in, in, in South Africa. All there, there's certain places in the world that are, are just uh, uh, mining and exploration heaven. And so uh, I was going to heaven. So I remember landing in Perth, in Australia, and uh, my first, my first, we were talking about accents earlier, Kenny, and my first experience with a different accent, you know, in, in the past being in, in America, uh, I would just hear accent. If I heard any accent that was different than American, it would just be, Oh, they're English. I didn't know. Right. So I went to Australia in the first month. I had no clue what anybody was saying. Right. I was just like, Oh, okay. Um, and, uh, so it took me a while to get my ear in and I'm pretty good with accents now, but, uh, I landed in Perth and I got myself like a, uh, a cheap car because I was going to be there for a few years to, to get my master's degree. Mm. And uh, I remember driving from, from Perth to Kalgoorlie. That's about 600 kilometers there. And I remember driving out there and uh, I just thought, you know, okay, the, the streets are, are, are paved with gold out there in Kalgoorlie. And, you know, 
there is gold out there, but actually the street on the way, uh, the highway on the way out there was paved with kangaroo carcasses. And I thought that was great because I'd seen kangaroos on television, you know, on the, on, on these nature channels. And I thought these were some endangered species, but uh, you know, they're like vermin over there. And so, you know, uh, and that's why in, in Australia, you see a lot of the cars and they call it, I got some good bar work, bar work. And they have these big bars on there so they can plow through these uh, kangaroos. They can be quite dangerous. I, uh, later on with, with this car, I've, I, I actually hit, hit some kangaroos and I, I, I really appreciate a uh, bar work right now because I did not have any of that th- at that stage. And I had to like, I was 300 kilometers away from home and I had to chitty, chitty, bang, bang my car back, back to Kalgoorlie <laughs> after this roo just absolutely tore up my front end. So anyway, so I, so I got to, uh, to, uh, to, to Kalgoorlie and uh, wow, what it, it, it did not disappoint. What a mining town. And as a young guy, you know, a single at that stage, uh, it was everything I'd ever imagined. I learned so much in Calgary. The Australians are great miners. These, the, the, they're, they're, they, they have the technology, they have the sophistication, and they have the work ethic. And they're mm-hmm. just great miners there. And, I, and that's why I always say I, I, I was reborn and rebred in Calgary, Western Australia. And so uh, I spent, um, I actually got my master's degree uh, in so what I studied there was uh, uh, e- uh, mining and exploration geology, as well as mineral economics. And I got mm-hmm. that uh, within uh, a year and a half. And, and so I got that in a year and a half. And it was very, uh, uh, um, it, 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 it was very helpful that previously I had worked for Newmont because for my master's thesis, I actually was able to hook up with Newmont Australia and do my project and work at the Batu Hijau Porphyry Copper Gold uh, deposit in Indonesia on the island of Sumbawa in Indonesia. So I, I did I, I, I did my thesis there and studied, and I worked there uh, for long for 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 quite a while. And, and mainly the reason there, there's actually a it's called the volcanic stratigraphy of uh, the Batu Hijau porphyry copper deposit in Sumbawa Island. You know, maybe it's find it find it out there. Certainly, it's in the in the library at Curtin, but it's I think it's on the internet as well. So that that was my thesis and, and kind of worked out all the volcanic stratigraphy there okay. but but uh I, I i you know in as i was in college and, and uh so so i had a uh it was, it was a great it was a great deal i had uh so it was a full, it was a full ride scholarship plus they gave me a stipend Whoa. right they gave me a stipend uh um a, as well a bit of money every month mm-hmm. so it was just a fantastic fantastic scholarship for a little bit of extra money you know my i prefer now my uh, my odd job that i did what i what i did then in, in one of my college years is i would always go the restaurants and I was a dishwasher. I love dishwashing. I could just put my earphones on, <laughs> listen to some music and just wipe those dishes. Very thera- therapeutic for me. So I always made a little extra cash mm. being a dishwasher. I love that job, but so many job opportunities. And, and, and once I came back to Calgary after finishing uh, working at, at uh, Batu Hijau is so many job opportunities, the mines there, I would implore uh, uh, um, any uh, aspiring geologist, to go to these mining towns or anybody, there's not just mining jobs, uh, just all the other jobs. This is where you want to go, right? For for jobs, if you're willing to work hard mm. and you want to uh, make some good money as a young person, these are the places to go, right? And so I I found I I I started with uh, some temp agencies and worked at um, uh, they, they were like uh, you know guns for hire basically, and I worked at so many projects uh, mm. uh, around their gold projects, and nickel projects, and then I found a home at uh, at 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 Karasu Dam, and that was a uh, an exploration project that I started. And, and we and that mine, you know, we we found and I stayed there from the exploration stage, the the discovery, all the way through to uh, uh, development and production. We 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 produced, and that was a a company eventually held by Sons of Gualia. Mm. And that mine is still going today. Actually, it was held by Saracen uh, Saracen Minerals, right? And Saracen Mineral, and that was event uh, now recently this last year taken over by Northern star resources. And so that is, has grown to uh, quite a uh, significant mining district in its own right, a Karasu dam. Mm. And what and, what was it like in, in, in that area? Because I mean, I remember I've, I've looked at this area on Google satellites because uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a, one of our colleagues is, uh, has a, has projects out in the Laverton area. And I remember going and zooming in on Google and it looks like you're on the surface of Mars or something, but you know, there's water, whereas there's no water left on Mars at the moment. But there are some huge mines in the area, you know, like Granny Smith mine, the Sunrise Dam mine, 
Um, well, it must have been it must have been awesome being there. So many huge mines in that area. Oh yeah, it's uh, and and the Karasu Dam was a new district, but that's right. Um, mm. These these are districts that never ever stop stop giving. You know, one one company goes does their thing, then they decide to okay they've wrapped up what they wanted to do, and they they let it go for a while. Then another company comes in, new ideas, and it just starts up again. There's so many of these districts like this. Mm. Um, we have Anova actually has a uh, a uh, an investment in a company called Torian Resources, which is out there around the um, uh, King of the Hills mine up there, up in Leonora. We, you know, I I worked in that area as well with uh, uh, the the company that you know Sons of Wally had Karasu Dam as well as uh, what we called Tarmula in those days. That was the Tarmula pit. Now they call it King of the Hills in that area. And and you're exactly right. These things just never stop giving. Look at the Golden Mile. Uh, w- which is uh, the super pit there? Um, that thing just never stops. And if if the pits stop, then they just keep going underground. And then the pits expand. A new company, new ideas. Yeah. And so it's yes. just a, it, this is why. And, and they they're just you know Leonora, Laberton, uh, around Waluna up there. You know the Jubilee and and uh, um, th- these Archean deposits. They just never ever stop. Yeah. And so that's why. Uh, it, um, when we looked at that strategic investment in, Tor- in Torian with Nova, this I have experience there. I've, I've been there. I've been intimately associated with that. I, I, I've seen how these mines never stop. And certainly that's the success that Torian's having now is showing that once again. And so we, it, it, was, it was great. It was just absolutely fantastic. Um, I, I just, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll never forget. Like I said, reborn, rebred. Anyway, so uh, we, we took that to development, Karasu Dam. And then uh, you know, uh, that I spent five, six years there. And so, uh, at, at that stage, it was, it was ready to move, to move on. I, 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 I advanced myself into, you know, very, very senior, senior, senior position there in the, uh, uh, eventually a mine, the mine geology, you know, I was exploration resource development and then the mine geology, but I thought, oh, you know, it's time to move on. Let's see what's going on. There was a, there was a company called Oxiana and they had a, uh, you know, a great project that they were, uh, looking at in, at Sepon. Sepon gold and copper uh, 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 um, uh, development up in Laos. And I thought, Laos, okay, this, what, 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 Lagos? Lagos? No, not Lagos, Laos. <laughs> so this is a landlocked country uh, between, uh, you know, up, up there between Thailand, yeah. uh, Cambodia, and uh, uh, Vietnam and China. And so, uh, 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 by the way, I, I love Laos uh, because it's, you know, I, I, I like Asia. I'd gone there several times for just uh, a holiday. You know, I, I like a lot of a lot of Asia, just the the, the culture and the whole the whole scene there. Uh, but Laos is beautiful. It reminds me a lot of Alaska. Laos only has five million people, so you get to uh, enjoy the uh, you know enjoy everything you like about Asia, but you don't have all the craziness, right? Like Bangkok and all these people, because Laos only has five million people. You got Thailand, like eighty million, uh, China, too, way too many to count, and Vietnam, and then you know 60, 70 million, and all these countries. And so Laos is a nice, it's a little gem sitting there, right, squished in between. And so I applied for the, uh, the geology manager position there, and, and, and I, I got that job. And we started up the, uh, um, that's when we started up the, the Sepon, the Sepon uh, gold and copper. And so this was really relevant experience because those were Carlin-style deposits. And that was similar, very, very same style that we had over in Nevada back in the days. And so we started up the gold mines, and then they also had a separate Copper, a super gene copper deposit, very high grade, you know, 4% copper. Uh, these deposits. We started up the gold mine first. Um, and, uh, and then later on, uh, after a few years of working the gold mine, then we started up the, uh, the copper operation, the super gene copper operation. And um, I, you know, I spent, I spent uh, uh, almost 15 years in Laos and also working for uh, Oxiana. Hmm. which has now been taken over by, uh, oh, it's taken over later on a- after I left, or right when I left uh, by uh, uh, MMG. And then I think they've now on sold that to the, uh, to other, other, uh, other, uh, another Chinese company. And then, so I, I spent about six years there. And then I, I went to the other Australian company, which was starting up after six years. And they were called Panost, Panost. And they had the Pucom copper gold deposit. And, uh, um, and so I went over to Panos to actually first to work in Thailand on their on another porphyry copper gold deposit they had in Thailand. And I worked there. And so I was the uh, um, 
uh, geology manager, manager there as well. And then I took over the regional geology manager position for them. And uh, we, we actually uh, uh, discovered and, and um, developed a, another in Laos, another in addition to their, their Pukam copper gold, that we found another one there called the Ban Hue Sai uh, silver gold deposit. And so we started, that's another operation we started up. And so, you know, I, I spent about 15 years in Laos. Uh, my, um, I actually, I, I couldn't leave. I met my wife there. My wife is actually uh, from Laos. And, um, and that's when I, I after, after, after 15 years in Laos, I decided, you know, I like Laos, but it's time to come on home, right? It's time to come on home. I've been yearning for, yearning to come on home for several years. And there was a bit of a, a lull in the market. And I thought, if I'm going to go home, this, this is the time to do it. And so I've come full circle now. And I found my opportunity. And I came on home. And with the, uh, uh, with the um, I, I, so I have my wife's Lao. We have four kids. And we all live here in, in Palmer, Alaska. Now, this is where all my extended family lives, my brother, my mother, and everybody. And so, and I came, I came back here. My brother actually owns a brewery, right? He owns a brewery up here. So I thought, okay, I'll go back to uh, Alaska and I have a bit of a, 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 an ownership share in the brewery and I'll, uh, I'll, uh, I'll start, I'll, I'll work with my brother in the brewery, get that going. And so uh, I spent about a year and a half when I first got here working in the brewery and kind of working on the marketing and sales and brewing every day, good hard work, right? Uh, in yeah. the brewery. Yeah. It's a craft brewery, right? So this this is all all, all the rage um, uh, in uh, in America anyway. Craft breweries, and we make some beautiful beers. You know, all these different uh, style of beers, IPAs, and different stouts. And we do some barrel aging now. The barley wines, mm -hmm. very nice. You know, you'd be surprised actually when you we when you're around beer all the time. I drink a whole lot less beer than I that I used to. I, I'm more of a sipper now. So uh, I've uh, I've uh, I've uh, I really learned to appreciate the finer aspects mm -hmm. of beer. And then, so uh, obviously my business is uh, exploration and, and mining. And so with the Australian connections, I, I started to look, to look around there over that year and a half and see what's going on in Alaska. And there was Nova Minerals uh, um, uh, right here in my backyard. And what a, what a, great, what a great project. And I, I, I know that project from, you know, I've always, always kept tabs uh, on what was going on in Alaska. And I know that project. And so, you know, through my Australian connections, uh, Louis actually, Louis Simmons, our, our executive director of NOVA, was was coming up to Alaska and he was here. And so Louis and I, uh, we 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 met up and um, we uh, spent a few days together and talked about the project. And I, I told him, you know, discuss my background and what I do. My niche is really uh, through the years has been taking these projects. Uh, um, my specialty has really been taking projects from that resource development stage and then bringing them into the production. And getting them produ into producing mines, and so that was a perfect fit for what Nova was trying to achieve, and uh, and that's when I when I started with Nova. That was that was uh, what was that 2019 now, so almost uh, yeah, two, been over two years mm -hmm. ago, mm -hmm. and so uh, and it's just been uh, and, and Nova's a perfect fit for me because I don't like to sit around, and it's just been they're, they're very aggressive, we're a very aggressive company. If we're going to do it, we're going to do it right, and we're going to get in there and actually do it, and so yeah. we've taken. With it, with this, um, and so that's where I am right now. I'm, I'm, I'm with Nova, and you know we can talk a bit about uh, about Nova if you'd like. I'll, I'll just stop there and let you guys get a word in. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, that's that's absolutely fascinating. I'm trying to think. You said you were born in '73, so you're. I mean, I was born in '72. So for for a guy that's in his his late forties, you've you've certainly been around the world, and you've, you know, you've you've. Been, Quite, quite an experience for such a young age. I mean, some of the people we've talked in the podcast, you know, they're, they're, they're in their 60s and you seem to have, have crammed, you know, a whole lifetime worth of experiences into, I, I don't know, maybe 25 years. It's uh, it's fascinating. I'm sure there's probably plenty of other stories you can you can tell us about your adventures in uh, all the, you know, Australia and then uh, Indonesia and then Laos. But uh, no, it would be, be good to get a... An overview, just that's a high level overview of the uh, Nova Minerals and the, the the Estelle Gold Deposit. And just just before we start, I was having a quick look at the presentation, and what did jump out at me was uh, Mark might remember this as well. So we had a, a professor on, uh, Richard Conroy of Conroy Gold, mm. and uh, his first discovery. Mark, can you remember that? Oh no, I can't. You can't remember. So that was a Pogo gold. Oh deposit. yes, of course it was. Oh, yeah. yeah, 
So when I was looking at the map just to see where your, your project was, that's what, what jumped out at me. But again, that was a similar story. I think he, they, they were right there at the beginning and uh, they took it right through to production. And Richard Conroy must be 80. Matt, you'll probably know better. He's in his 80s anyway, yeah, isn't he? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 He's, 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 again, there's another fascinating, char- fascinating character. It's, 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 he's been around the globe and done and multiple things. But uh, yeah, so tell, tell us about the Estelle project, Christopher. Right, so yeah, uh, Pogo, of course, that's one of the major producing mines here in in Alaska. And yeah. Northern Star Minerals, well, uh, as you know, recently took that over in the in the past few years and uh, really really turned that around. Sumitomo Metals had that before, and they, you know, this is one of those. This, this is what Australians are so good at, right? You know, Sumitomo had it; they kind of did what they had to do, and 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 then they they flogged it off, thinking they couldn't really, you know, go further. Northern Star, an Australian company, comes in. And turns it around, and it's one of their, you know, their top producers now. So uh, yeah. just to goes to show you once again, vouches yeah. for the the Australian um, a- ambition and 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 mining intellect. So, and we also have you know, it was interesting uh, last year, fifty percent of the uh, total investment in the exploration and mining industry in Alaska was from Australian companies, and so we call it the Aussie invasion. And bring it on, we love it, right? And so we think that's going to be even more more. Uh, looks like it's going to be more this year. I see there's another uh, there's other Australian companies that have done some staking of claims this year. So that'll just grow going forward. And what better partner to have in Alaska than uh, Australian companies that are, that are really serious about this stuff. So Estelle is an intrusive related gold system. To give you, give you the, the, the picture, we're in the Tintina Gold Province. So this is the, uh, this is a large belt that stretches Kind of a you know an upside down U shape all the way from western Alaska in over to the east into the Yukon. You have a significant uh, you know deposits there are Pogo of course, uh, Fort Knox, Kinross. This is that that area is where I started uh, my career. Fort Fort Knox, Kinross, Victoria Gold, the Dublin Gulch uh, project over on the Yukon side, Donlin Creek, uh, which is uh, Nova Gold Barrick. That's uh, the forty million ounce Donlin Creek. So 10 million plus ounce deposits, not uncommon in our neighborhood or here. So this is the belt where you had the historic gold rushes. You know, this is where the Klondike and uh, the, the great gold rushes in, in Fairbanks and even the gold on the, uh, uh, in Nome there, the beach sands in Nome shed, shed off of this belt. Now we know where all that gold came from. So this is, this, this is the area here, right? And so uh, we sit just on the, southern, on the southern end of that belt. and we have the Estelle Gold Project, 324 square kilometers of, uh, of claims now. Uh, and we, we've really been focused on a very uh, one area we call the Corbell deposit. This represents only 2% of the total land area across our claims. And we focused on the Corbell deposit. We, our growth has been uh, in terms of resource, increasing the resource inventory at Corbell alone has just been phenomenal, and I would say unique, or at least uh, 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 extremely wa- rare, in terms of what else is uh, in terms of the the, uh, the global uh, other achievements around the world. So, in within two years, so we we started. We had a maiden resource in 2019 of two and a half million ounces after our first drill program. Then, a a year later, we uh, increased our resource to 3.3 million ounces. And then six months later, we recently came out with our April 2021 uh, resource update. Uh, we now sit at 4.7 million ounces at the Corbell deposit of loan alone, and it just remains wide open in all directions and huge upside to go within the Corbell resource, uh, within the Corbell Valley there, the Corbell deposit. So it remains wide open. The strike length is currently of the deposit which we call Corbell, Maine, which is only one zone within the Corbell Valley. But that Corbell Mound, the strike length is currently 1.8 kilometers open on both ends. We have drilling planned. Uh, start, it's going on right now to, to continue to step out drill. In addition, uh, the, other, the second drill rig will be doing infill all year going uh, into, the, uh, in, into the southern area and the southeast area where we, we believe the starter pit will be to infill drill and start to prove those resources up 
to uh, measure in indicated categories in order to translate into uh, uh, reserves for, for, our, for our coming upcoming PFS. And so we came out with the, with the 4.7 million ounce resource in April, only set to grow with the drilling just to continue. And now what we're working on is uh, for Corbell, really on a fast track to production here uh, for Corbell, is that um, uh, uh, we are pinning down and looking at our flow sheet. So we've done a lot of metallurgical test work, a lot of uh, test work there to get our flow sheet of how we're going to process this material. Initially, you know, always in the past, it's an intrusive related gold system. We look at our peers. These are bulk mineable, uh, heap leachable style deposits, very long mine life, 20, 30 year mine life or more on these deposits. It's right on the surface, open pit style, uh, the very low to approaching zero strip ratio because the geometry of the deposit is such that, you know, you're not really mining a narrow vein where you have to go through a lot of waste just to keep driving yeah. down on the vein and kind of looking for the vein. The, 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 uh, the deposit is such that the, the intrusive, it's an intrusive rock, all one rock type, and it's a mineralized intrusive throughout. So there's just sheeted veins throughout this mineralized intrusive. So the geometry is such that it's like a large elliptoid shape, like a big blob. It's a, it's a, a you know, like a Zeppelin sitting in there. And so you can mine this and have a very low strip ratio. Basically that means anything you almost everything you dig up is some kind of pay dirt. You don't have a lot of waste. And that lends itself to very, very ideal economics, allowing you to mine material being on the surface and that long mine life and uh, the geometry and low strip ratio, mine at a very low cutoff grade, which means that, uh, uh, you know, if, if heap leach basically pays for so. And that's how we initially looked at this uh, Corbell deposit as a heap leach style, because this is what Fort Knox and Victoria is going. But it, as part of our studies, our metallurgical and well, uh, studies, we also tested ore sorting technology. Now, ore sorting technology has come such a long way in, in recent years, and it's just proven technology. We used, we looked at XRT. This is laser ore sorting. And so what we found is when we put, um, our test work was done on a, on a rock sample of 0.5 grams per ton. When we put that through the ore sorter, uh, it, it spit out the other end. What was accepted was six gram per ton material. And so, wow, what an upgrade. That's, a, that's amazing. So this material that, that, that we initially thought was mainly all heap leach, we can upgrade this stuff to six gram material and then look at a milling circuit. And, and it's, it's starting to line up that that's actually where we can get the maximum profit. That's the most economic way to mine this thing. And so yeah. it's been a bit of a, a change in thinking. And it's just all driven by the test work results, of course. And so... Um, because, and the reason for this is if you look at our ore body, you have these sheeted veins. These veins are very discreet, very sharp, and a very distinct mineralogy in these veins, you know, quartz and the arsenal pyrite in there. And so the laser can easily, it's like black and white. The laser ore sorters can easily pick this material out. And so what we find is that no matter what grade we put in there, I can put 0.1 material in there, 0.1 gram per ton, and it'll still accept and, and the, and the, um, uh, uh, the accepted material will still be, you know, five, six grams per ton. So it just comes down to an operating cost. How much material can you actually shove through this machine before it doesn't pay it anymore? So we, but we know we can put material in there at a very low grade and have it upgraded. Now, you know, you, you, you set the, you calibrate the machine. So you want maximum gold recovery of the material you put in there. So what we find is that we can get upwards of 90% of the gold recovery of the material that we get out, uh, it, um, uh, that, that gets accepted, 90% of the gold is recovered. And if you set it to that to la that level, the, gr the grade is still around two, two and a half grams per ton. So that, that's at about a 50% mass pull. So let's say you put in 10 million tons, 50% of that, so 5 million tons gets accepted, which is 90% 90, 90 of the gold is in that accepted material running at two, two and a half grams per ton. That material then goes to the milling circuit. And what we're finding, just a, a conventional milling circuit. So what we're finding in the test work there is that we mill it and then we're getting very good recoveries. And I don't want to put numbers on it yet because that's all uh, to come to be revealed and, and to come and there's still test work going on. But we're getting very good numbers in the gravity, which is a very cheap processing method. Also, uh, so we have some free gold in gravity and also in, we can do flotation for some of this arsenal pyrite. We then take that and we've now, it's like a funnel. Now we've really we concentrated through gravity and flotation. You've further reduced the volume. Now you have a concentrate after those two 
of a very high grade, you know, we're talking 10 to 15 grams per ton, which mm -hmm. then goes into intensive leach, into an intensive leach uh, where we're finding recoveries of uh, upper, uh, over 90%, let's just say. And so that's, that's what's shaping up here. And so this idea that the deposit is mainly a heat leach deposit is, is not really what we're seeing, what the te test work is, is, uh, is leading us towards. The, uh, the ideal scenario is that we use these ore sorters which are, you know, the capex on these ore sorters is very, is, uh, you know, they're about 900 grand a machine. You line a few of those up, very small in the, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the overall uh, uh, capex. And so, and then you've upgraded and you have a milling circuit. And so, um, and, and reducing the volume with all these concentration steps, ore sorting, flotation, gravity, then the tailings out the back end is very limited uh, uh, as well, because you've really reduced that, that, that volume down for, uh, for, for wet, wet tailings. And so that's what's shaping up right there. Now, what I'm talking about here is the Corbell deposit. This is our starter operation, right? This is where we're on a, uh, on, on a fast path, fast track to production on the path to production. Our, we want our scope. Once this flow sheet is, spin, is pinned down here in May, uh, we'll be coming out with a scoping study in, uh, uh, in, in mid, mid year. And that'll start to show the market, show people uh, what an economic uh, uh, what a operating scenario might look like. Uh, and then uh, in 2022, we'll go straight into, into the feasibility studies, PFS, and 2022, 2022 2023 feasibility studies, 2024, uh, some kind of 2025, some kind of decision of mine. We'd like to be digging up the first dirt for this operation and pouring our first gold bar by 2025 uh, um, around that time frame. Ambitious for sure, but we are on, uh, on this, at this rate, we think we believe we can meet we can meet it. One of the critical elements of course is curse of course is permitting. And permitting, uh, we believe that we our impact, especially with the uh, the uh, lower footprint uh, type operation, which is having a milling circuit as, as opposed to these large heap leach circuits, that we will be able to minimize our impact on any wetlands if there are any, because we're doing that survey now, but we will minimize on any wetlands and that will allow us to do an EA an environmental assessment as opposed to an e, a full-blown EIS. And that'll really streamline our permitting process. And so we're working on that. Now, so that, that's Corbell. Uh, the sweet spot for us is because we want, we're an aspiring producer. And you know, we're not here to play the market or, or uh, be, be a lifestyle company. We're, we're an aspiring producer. The sweet spot for us is to have an operation where we can produce 150 to 250,000 ounces a year at least Get the get the reserves for a ten year at least a minimum ten year mine life. Uh, we believe we have an area to get a one to one and a half year payback in there. Uh, in this area, we, we believe we'll have a starter pit, and uh, that's just the beginning. That's a starter for us, and then we'll grow from there because that Corbell Valley alone, we're sitting on. We believe we're sitting on one of these ten million ounce whoppers, four point seven million ounces already. But uh, uh, you know, heaps of upside at, at at the Corbell main. A zone as well as what we call blocks A, block B, the cathedral. All these are in Corbell Valley. And at Cathedral, which we'll be drilling this year as well, we've got um, several ounces per ton in the uh, rock chips. We'll be drilling that. So, so uh, uh, we're going to be making significant strides forward to get closer to that 10 million ounces by the time our next resource upgrade comes out. Uh, and we're working to get another resource update come out later this year. And so that's yeah. uh, what I'm talking about is the Corbell Valley, the Corbell deposit. 2% of our total land area across the 324 square kilometer claims, another 15 other known prospects at various stages of advancement, plus numerous unnamed prospects uh, across the, uh, you know, when you fly over the, uh, the area, not much vegetation, and you look down and there's just these screaming uh, uh, color anomalies, they're just screaming at you, and we need to get down there this year. Uh, I have uh, some uh, exploration geology teams lined up to go down there and start the mapping and sampling to start to name some of these other uh, uh, um, areas where we're seeing these anomalies, get some sample results. So watch for the news flow on that. But 15 other known prospects across the claims. The next cab off the rank is what we call the RPM prospect, which is 20 miles along mineralized strike to the south of the Corbell deposit. And so I say mineralized strike because this is a, a, a mineralized intrusive complex, which stretches all the way from Corbell to RPM. And, and like I said, there's numerous other known and unknown prospects along that mineralized strike. It's like a kid in a candy store out there, really. Yeah. And so down there at RPM, 
I have, uh, we've done some rock chip sampling there last year. There was a news release, nine to 10 ounces per ton in that, in those rock chips. We've identified a new zone. So there's RPM and now we've identified RPM South. Uh, we believe those two zones connect here. Uh, there's a historic drill hole there, 120 meters at over a gram. We have up to, uh, and maybe every look, look, looking like a bit more, uh, five, let's say five to 10,000 meters planned to drill at RPM. I have the drill pads, the first drill pad set up there. Uh, the rig is ready to go. We're just waiting for it to get a little bit warmer and get some uh, water flow from the snow. So we have a water source for our drilling. We're going to start drilling that in May, it looks like. And then we, what we want to do, our plan is to come out with the first maiden resource this year, later this year on RPM. And I don't want to speculate how many millions of ounces are there, but this will add some serious, uh, let's call it depth to the project, to the Estelle Gold Project, because now we'll have two resource areas to, to, that we'll be advancing uh, uh, into the future. Corbell, of course, and RPM. And so most of our, I have four rigs this year. Most of our um, uh, uh, most of our work will be done at Corbell infill step out, continuing to develop, uh, add resources in that Corbell deposit. But one rig will be going to RPM to start uh, 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 get a maiden resource there and start advancing that prospect uh, uh, as uh, as well as well. Yeah. I must I must admit before I, I, we started this podcast, I was obviously I downloaded the presentations and had a look at the website. And one of the questions I was was going to ask you was. Uh, are you not concerned that you've only got one project? But now that you've uh, you've told me all about this the, this uh, area, it sounds like you've got about ten projects. And as you say, it's like you know a kid a kid in a sweetie shop. You know, it's, there's there's just multiple multiple prospects within this this. Uh, did you say was it three hundred twenty five square kilometers? Right, total area. Yeah, that's right. Uh, yeah, there's no shortage of no. of. Uh, of, of prospects or, or targets that we have, you know, when you, when you have, have something that's a, a sure thing, you, you concentrate on that. So that's why there's been so much focus yeah. on Corbell. That'll get us into, into a producing mine into a, 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 an actual, you know, we've we kind of made the trans the transition from exploration company. Now we're, we, we're develop a developer and to be a producer is our, to get to that producer stage. Of course, we're concentrating on Corbell, but you know uh, it's all about uh, what do they call it? QQRT quantity, quality, resources, and time. And so like, how do you juggle these things? And uh, a lot of our resources and time are going to Corbell, of course, to get that get to that next stage of producer. But the other ones are in the wings. Like I said, big focused on RPM. That's the next cab off the rank. And there's no shortage for the, for uh, what comes next across those, uh, across those prospects. And there, you know, there's information out there in previous news releases. We have the shoe shine prospect. Uh, uh, we're going to be uh, the, the stony vein. Stony Vane will be hitting that here pretty early this this year. T five, the train prospect, and then I said, uh, "Well, so many unnamed ones that are just looking at us, and we just need to get down there on the ground." So yeah, there's a, a pipeline. We're really unlocking a district here. It's not just about Corbell. We're unlocking the district, and we're going to have a pipeline of projects uh, uh, of prospects that will feed into that central Corbell processing area. Or alternatively, if they're if they're big enough, you know, you you uh, you start another operation in the future down at down at RPM, which is 20 miles to the south. Who who knows how it all developed? But certainly those ones closer to Corbell will will feed into uh in, in into uh in, into actually the Corbell, the Corbell area. So yeah, pipeline of prospects uh will be at working out here for years. Yeah. It, you know, we always say internally, we're not going home until we got 50 million ounces at the back in the bank, right? <laughs> and so, yeah. and you know, uh that's not saying that in jest. We just look at it and go like, huh, oh, geez, this is huge. And yeah. so uh um and the geological fundamentals are certainly there to uh, to to have that type of a, a gold district, world world class gold district, world class resources, and uh, we're working to start uh, 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 be a, become a world class producer. Now that's the next that's the next step. So overall, you know, we're talking 40, 50 year mine life when it all we take everything in, into account. So that's the problem with many 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 projects. You have you're, you're like a one trick pony. You got that deposit, and there's not much upside. Upside here is huge. So, you know, Nova Minerals, in terms of our flagship Estelle Gold Project, huge upside in one of the top tier, always consistently in all the ratings, top tier five, top five uh, in the in terms of jurisdictions for uh, uh, you know a sovereign risk and 
streamlined path to development in terms of the permitting and all that. So being in Alaska, uh, very safe, safe jurisdiction. Plus, uh, with you know, with the gold, we're, we're a gold company with the gold price. Right now, we're very under, undervalued. Big uh, short-term opportunity, very, very undervalued in terms of our, our uh, resource um, va- valuation. So short-term, especially with the news coming out here with our flow sheet and the scoping study at mid-year, very, uh, very, very short-term opportunity there to, to look at Nova Minerals as well. And then, of course, the long-term, which is the, the upside and such. Yeah, yeah. And I imagine you guys have no trouble raising money with obviously, you know, 4.7 million ounce resource. There'd be no shortage of takers for, you know, for reasons. Right. Yeah. So we have, I mean, we have, we currently have, you know, just over 20 million in the bank, Australian. Uh, and so uh, we're, we're, we're pretty frugal as well. You know, we, we, uh, to, to, um, we, we, we have been drilling last year, our, our drilling, we drill at about $230 per meter. Right. And so, to uh, as a comparison, using a benchmark Kalgoorlie and Kalgoorlie, which has all the infrastructure, very accessible. It, it, the average drilling cost there is about one hundred and ninety dollars per meter. So we're doing very, very good considering our our uh, you know more uh, mountainous and uh, re- remote locations. So we're doing very good. But we're always looking to cut that. Some of the things we're doing is we're putting an on-site prep lab. So la- in previous years we've taken the entire sample. Uh, and we've shipped it out to the lab for them to do the prep. So you're talking about one sample that is 30 kilos. Now what we're talking, and you fly all that out, all that freight cost, take it up to the lab. Yeah. Now what we're talking about is taking those samples and doing that first stage of crushing and splitting. So you're taking a, um, a, uh, a, 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 a 30 kilo sample and you're bringing that down to, uh, 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 to, to less than, less than, less than two, two kilos. So you can see, that that's a uh, significant reduction in the overall cost. And we're doing all that work in terms of freight costs. We're doing all that work on site now. So we'll yeah. have that on site this year. That'll reduce cost big time. And l- last year, we also had uh, b- issues with just turnaround time. We were waiting over four months for samples sometimes. So now that should alleviate part of that process where we can just take that, that one, two kilo sample and s- ship it straight to the, uh, the lab for analysis. It doesn't have to go to their, to their prep lab first here. It could just go straight to the analytical lab. Mm-hmm. So we're doing that. Uh, we use a lot of helicopters, uh, helicopter use. And so one of the things that we're doing uh, this year is uh, from the camp, which is about 10 miles away from uh, the Corbell deposit. We're putting in uh, on the snow road this year. I brought in very large earth moving equipment, dozer excavator. So we're putting in our own track, a permanent track uh, this time, much more of the nice surface on it. So that we'll reduce helicopter time from uh, driving from the, through the job site at Corbell and back. And so we'll save major costs on helicopters there. Uh, and uh, all, always looking to save costs. So we're doing very well. Our, our, our discovery cost remains under, under $5 per ounce. And we're, we're and, you know, anything under about 10 is just, is just um, mm. very, just exceptional in this industry. So we're, 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 we're tracking really well in terms of our, of our, of our costs. And we're always looking for savings. Mm. Brilliant. I mean, I don't. Yeah, yeah, we, me and Kenny were very quiet, but but you know, we, we I enjoyed listening to them. And I mean, I think you, Christopher, your uh, you touched on it before, and your experience in Australia and being in in that heart with all that all um all the activity there and the huge mines. And as we as you've been talking away, I've been sort of flying around on Google in the in the area, and uh, I found I found where you are. Uh, I, I the, the video on your website is is pretty good though it it shows very clearly where you are if you go down and have a look on that that's very good and of course you can also see the other projects in the area so it's kind of similar maybe in that regard the terrain's very different but in terms of big deposits what you're sort of used to in uh, in Western Australia and it is very mountainous but you know there's a, there's, there's an awful lot of big um, big gold projects there. So um, it's, 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 yeah. And before I started, I, I, I interviewed you for the first time. I, I did not even consider Alaska, you know, <laughs> but and what do, I think you said something at the start though, like in Alaska, we'd, we'd go big. I can't remember what word you said, but it, you, you, you had a phrase where, you know, it's like it all happens in Alaska or we don't mess around here or something like that. And uh, right. I can kind of, I can kind of see why. You, you, you know, you know these, ty- these type of deposits are relatively new. You know, you mentioned you didn't think of Alaska, but people are catching on. Certainly mm. uh, resource type uh, you know, uh, companies from resource type economies, Australia uh, particularly, 
and where they have you know such a large resource that they're catching on. And mm. so it's just it's been very uh, uh, it, these deposits, Fort Knox, Victoria Gold, they just started up uh, uh, a year or two ago. And mm. so it's it's a relatively new uh, uh, type of discovery. The intrusive related gold system is a relatively in new. Um, uh, deposit style. It hasn't been around for very long, you know. It, mm. It's only been around for twenty years since uh, you know uh, Fort Knox was probably the first the first one to really to really uh, produce one of these things. And now companies are starting to catch on. You know, there's a bit of a, a bit of lag time before companies really catch on. Mm. And Alaska's always been a bit. Uh, people view it as uh, in, in the past and say, "Oh, it's kind of remote, too difficult to operate there." Well, I think companies like Nova Minerals now and now Northern Star are showing that. Wait a minute. We have they have all the infrastructure up there. They have a, a great resource sector with all the uh, suppliers and and uh, a great pool of talent of, of resource. We're, you know, we're a resource economy up here. We do oil, minerals, lumber, timber, fishing, all these resources. And so mm. uh, mining is a big part of the Alaskan economy. And we have the resources here and the suppliers to do. It. And people are seeing that now and appreciating it for what it is. It's not that hard, really. And look at the and even if you uh, and at the end of the day. Look at the payback. Look what you get. And so mm. uh, people are catching on. And I think uh, Nova Minerals is really a first mover in this. And um, uh, you, you'll see a lot more activity uh, as we're going forward. It, I alluded to it earlier. There's already been a, a bit of a staking, mm-hmm. a claim staking rush up here. And okay. you'll hear more about those companies as they come out and r- report on their their work programs and discoveries in, in years to come. So exciting times ahead. For exciting. Exciting, time. radar. exciting. Yeah, I will. And, and thank you for that. I'm sure it'll put, put Asker on a few, a few of our listeners radar. Uh, but I mean, that's just brilliant. I mean, we were about an hour there of a podcast, so it's a good, good time to, uh, to, to, to sort of finish up. I think Kenny, have you got any final thoughts there for Christopher or are you? All... Yeah, well, I, I would, I would like to get you back on because I could have probably listened for about another hour and a half, but whether they are listening, Listeners would want to listen for two and a half hours, but no, it's it's it's, it's, it's fascinating stuff, and it sounds as if you guys are, you know, uh, as you said, you, you are very aggressive, and if you want to do something, you, you do it right and you and you do it properly, properly. So, uh, yeah, I'm definitely going to have a have a look, and the, the market cap is a, uh, it's it's not that particularly high for a company. It's got that, is it two hundred million dollars the market cap, Christopher? Two fifty, yeah. 250 yeah um and it's it's not we, that we've high. been as high you know we've been as high as almost 400 so a uh, bit of a bit of a pullback as you know when, once you in the last few months we've been really in the in the trenches doing our resource models and ver- data verification so it hasn't been a, as exciting as news flow plus that coupled with the gold price kind of stagnating a, a little bit and going down but uh there's a big move coming there's a big there's a big move coming with all the the, uh, the gold price seems to be lifting up a bit. And with all this scoping study and flow shit we got coming out, plus we're really starting to ramp up the drilling again now. And so I think, um, like I said, a, a short term op- opportunity in the next three to six months or or before, you'll still you'll, you'll really see a re rate in, in, in no yeah. share. And, and, and you guys are you listed in OTC as well from memory? That, that's correct. So, yep. so we are, yeah, we're on the OTC as well as in Frankfurt and in, in Frankfurt, right. but yep. primary ASX. Perfect. All right, good stuff. Well, I appreciate your time tonight, Christopher. Or, well, it's not tonight. It's tonight for us. It'll be, what, is it morning for you? 11, yeah, 11 a.m. 11 a.m., yep. Brilliant. All right, well, en- enjoy the rest of your day. And uh, I'm I'm sure we'll speak again in the next uh, few months, hopefully with a, a further resource upgrade or, or similar. Absolutely. Th- thanks for having us. Look forward to the next uh, update slash, uh, you know, friendly discussion like this it was really a good time and uh we'll keep you posted great Perfect. Great. great thank you very much christopher cheers thank you cheers thank you for listening to another podcast from market musings with fairben and russell tune in next time <laughs>